वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु We are studying the Bhagavad Gita, and we are in the second chapter. Of the eighteen chapters, the second chapter is the most important. It basically contains the essence of the teaching, and in the second chapter, the teaching about the Atman, our self, who we really are, that is the central teaching. So that's what Sri Krishna has been telling Arjuna till now. We have covered that part. We have we have studied about that. while wrapping up that teaching the doctrine of the atman sri krishna m- mentions two important concepts in indian thought um not just hindu vedanta or hindu thought but also buddhist uh, jain sikh the indian uh, an uh, uh, important concept of the indic world view what are these two concepts The first one is given in verse twenty-seven, and the second one in twenty-eight. We have done up to twenty-seven last time. In twenty-seven, Sri Krishna said, "For those who die, for those who are born, death is certain. Jata sya hi dhruvo mrityu. Death is certain for those who are born. This is common sense. We all know this. This is one truth that we all know without any kind of religion, whether you are theist, atheist." whether you follow a religion buddhist christian hindu whatever you are whatever we are we know that death is certain but the second part of that verse dhruvam janma mritasya cha that is something new for the, for those who are dead rebirth is certain so we die this body dies which means that we do not die with the death of the body there is something that is that continues and is again reborn in other lives in other bodies so this idea the doctrine of of um reincarnation punarjanma many lives many bodies um this doctrine it's a central feature of indian thought i have have had occasion to mention this earlier that in spite of the tremendous diversity in um, ideas about god there are um, um different schools of hinduism which believe in god but god may be with form may be without form may be male or female or beyond gender there are schools of hinduism which do not believe in god there is buddhism which does not believe in god there is jainism which does not believe in god there are different ideas about the nature of this universe about what is the nature of the human problem and what is the solution so many different ideas are there so many different practices are there but there's one thing common to all these uh, streams of thought all throughout in ancient india all of them they believed in this idea this concept of reincarnation that this is not the only life that we have had we have had many lives in the past and we will continue to do so therefore we do not die with the death of the body death is death of the physical body but something continues over there is an afterlife and there are many lives in fact to come so this is a a, a, a very fundamental part of the indic world view and why indic world view i was just thinking all the religions of the world they all believe in some kind of afterlife I was at the New York Ethical Society and you know the one just down the it's in on 64th I think. It's a very old institution. It's um, 1876 1877. So their leader we, we were in a discussion yesterday in the evening and um, their leader was telling me how it came to be founded. It's in 1876. Uh, Felix Adler who uh, a, a Jewish man from Brooklyn who was training to be a rabbi he went to germany and studied philosophy and it seems his mother warned him nothing good will come of of that <laughs> and it didn't depending on your perspective because he did then he lost faith in god <laughs> he said uh, he's not he doesn't he can't believe anymore in religion and god and all of that but 
definitely believes in values and ethics and meaning in life. So he founded the Ethical Society here. Anyhow, we were in a discussion and somebody raised the, the question, what is so terrible if um, after death there is nothing? Simply, that's the end. Of course, there is matter. I mean, the body will disintegrate into the elements and so on. Um, the energy in this body will be released into the uh, system. But there is no personal continuity. There is no continuity of, of the sentient being which we regard ourselves to be. This one does not exist anymore after death. What's so terrible about it? What's so terrible about it? What's wrong with that? The only thing that I commented was to the discussion was... Um, what is terrible about it and what's wrong with that? That's, it's a huge question. But note one thing. All the religions of the world, from the most primitive uh, cave dwellers, uh, they also talk, they, they, you see in the paintings, there is their depictions of death and a spirit world afterwards. All religions of the world, all the uh, traditions, the native traditions in um, Australia, in, in America here, in India, in every part of the world, and all the major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Hinduism, all its varieties, Sikhism, all religions of the world, Taoism, Shintoism, Taoism, all of, all, of, all of them, Confucianism, all of them believe that there is something that continues after death. One lady, she said, no, no, uh, I don't think there's any afterlife in Judaism. Uh, I, I've heard this from um, Jewish people, that in Judaism we don't, there's no heaven, hell, nothing after death. But that's a wrong idea. You just have to Google it once, afterlife in Judaism. Immediately you get enormous amount of information. The thing is, and if you in fact look at the uh, Bible, the Old Testament, um, all this idea of an immortal soul and heaven and hell, did, was the whole thing invented by Jesus? No. In fact, Jesus, his contribution is not so much original as taking out the essential spiritual teachings of the existing uh, Judaic traditions and giving them in a new, creative, concentrated form. It's not that he invented something anew. So those were all there in the, in the uh, uh, Hebrew texts. In fact, if you look at the entire Judaic tradition, all the texts, including the rabbinic tradition down the ages, they are vague or are sometimes clear that there is an afterlife. Maimonides, the great teacher, he spoke about uh, not only one afterlife, but a greater afterlife after that afterlife. So very close to... I was just thinking the Vedanta idea that we have many lives, but ultimately the reality is all that will stop and we realize our, ourselves as Brahman. So an afterlife, after the afterlife also makes sense actually. Anyhow, so you have all these views, but I noticed one thing. I just, all, all courtesy Google, it takes a five minute search. You get all the data. I noticed one thing. There is no Jewish teacher throughout the history of Judaism who has said clearly there is no afterlife. There, there, nobody has said clearly what a materialist might say. There is nothing after death. It all ends with death. No Jewish teacher has ever said that. And I, I, my instinct was, was that that would be the case. It's impossible to have religion without nothing beyond death. So, it's not just Hinduism. Every religion says some, there is something after, after death. But the Indian religions go further and say that. Uh, that afterlife, it's like a cycle, repetition. We are reborn again and again. Some others may say that, no, they, we are not reborn again and again, but we continue to exist in some kind of suspended animation until um, such, certain things will happen and so on. But every religion agrees that death is not the end. So that's, that's the point. Now, Sri Krishna introduces that idea here. An associated idea would, with reincarnation is the law of karma or, or the doctrine of karma. I wouldn't say law of karma, doctrine of karma. What propels birth and death and rebirth? What's behind all of that? And the Hindu idea, in fact the Indian idea, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, is that it is cause and effect. Everything that we see, 
These are consequences of certain causes set in motion in past lives. And what we do now consciously are causes being set in motion now, forces being set in motion now, which will give results in future. Since we, we have this life, it's an effect of past causes, so we must have existed in the past. If, if this is true, if this train of thinking is true, then we must have some, in some form existed in the past. And if all our karma is not existed in this present life, if we generate new karma, new causes in this life, then we will have to exist to get the results of those karmas in the future. So many lives in the past and many lives extending to the foreseeable future, that's what Sri Krishna introduced in 27th verse. We did this last time. The second important conception he introduces uh, in 28th verse, we shall see. Avyakta di nibhutani Avyakta di nibhutani Vyakta madhyani bharata Madhyani bharata Avyakta nidhana neva Avyakta nidhana neva Tatra ka paridevana Tatra ka paridevana O descendant of Bharata, he means Arjuna. All beings have un the unmanifest as their beginning, are manifest in the middle, and have their dissolution in the unmanifest itself. So why lament for them? Here, the Indian idea of creation and destruction, or more precisely projection and withdrawal, are, uh, is mentioned here. He says, since we have existed in the past and we will exist in the future after death also. But how we were in the past is not known to us. We, we were not in this form. And what we will be in the future is not known to us. Certainly we will not be in this body. So that was unmanifest. It was not visible, not, not, not um, present for our experience. And the future is also not visible. But what is available right now is this life. So This is manifest. But it goes beyond this. What he wants to say is, everything in this universe, this state in, in which we find them, he calls it vyakta or manifest. Manifest means available for experience. Uh, they are available for experience. You can see them, hear them, talk with them. Uh, or if any object, uh, time, space, matter, energy, living beings, all of them, they are manifest now. You can see. But there was a time when these were not there. Now the question is, did they not exist at all? Or did they exist in some unmanifest form? The Vedantic idea which Krishna is introducing here is, the idea of creation and destruction is, not that there is creation from nothing. There is creation from something. And not that destruction is something into nothing. It is something into something else. Well, let me make it a little more, um, let me make it a little more clear. Suppose, um, like an example is, from a seed, in the seed there is no tree. Right now there is a tree, but before this tree was there, it was a seed. It did not pop out of existence from, in, from thin air. It was there as a seed. And everything that you see in the tree, at least in outline, was there in the genetic material encoded in that seed. But it was unmanifest. What do I mean by unmanifest? When I say everything of the tree was there in the seed, I don't mean that if you investigate the seed, will you find roots and branches and leaves and fruits and birds and nests on the... Uh, no, nothing. Nothing. You will not find any of that. And yet, the entire potential of the tree was there in the seed. And now we know it much better. With the advances in genetics, for the last 100, 200 years, we have known it. Um, especially with the discovery of, in the recent years, of, uh, of the chromosomes and the DNA. Um, so we know the, the fact that what we see expressed as living beings, the characteristics of ourselves, they were all there in the seed. Uh, so it, is transmuted, uh, trans, it was in an unmanifest form. When it sprouts and develops, you see a gradual manifestation of an unmanifest, of a pre-existing unmanifest potential. And the tree may die, but 
what what the tree was is again encoded in a seed so it goes back into the uh, unmanifest that's what we say another a simpler example is a potter he takes clay and molds it into a pot and if he's not satisfied he may push it all back into a featureless lump of clay now one way of looking at it is that the pot was entirely there in the clay every bit of it was there in the clay the potter just gave it a shape and it, when he destroys the shape it's not that the pot is gone the reality called the pot was nothing but the clay and it has gone back to the clay so it was the pot was pre-existing in the clay in an unmanifest form when you when you call it a pot it's manifest but afterwards when it's again a lump of clay we'll say the pot is still there in an unmanifest form the thing is unmanifest means you cannot see it hear it smell it taste it touch it you can't take it to pottery barn and and uh, and and sell it you can't put water in it you can't uh, you can't use it so unmanifest means it's not available for transactions but in a potential form it's there that is the hindu idea of creation the idea of this entire universe it has not come out of nothing it existed in an unmanifest form for the entire universe it's not a seed or a lump of clay rather uh, in vedanta we call it maya it existed as maya the power of god ishvara shakti the power of god and then creation started in uh, sanskrit srishti srishti means projection so what was already there in maya in an unmanifest form was in maya this uh, would you would you have found stars and galaxies and plants and and uh, vedanta societies and things like that in in maya no none of it neither time nor space nor matter nor an energy none of it was there but when srishti starts all of it is projected out and so you have this universe or uh, this physical universe which which we see time space matter energy stars and planets and life and all of that and the idea is one day it'll all be destroyed what is destruction what is destruction not complete destruction this whole thing will again go back into its potential form as maya and then after an, a, a timeless duration uh, duration without time again projection starts srishti so when projection starts unmanifest to manifest stars and planets you know matter and time and space and energy are projected out you know, now you may call it a big bang or whatever and the entire universe is presented before us and after an immeasurable period of time again it collapses back into again i don't know today you might call it a singularity or something but even beyond that into the unmanifest which is maya so all beings have their beginning in the unmanifest in the middle they are manifest what is middle we call it a living being we call it a universe and the end is again unmanifest we call it death we call it the destruction of the universe so this is the idea of creation existence and destruction in vedanta in sanskrit srishti sthiti pralaya srishti sthiti pralaya and uh, the idea in vedanta is so not only vedanta in any religion god is said to be the cause of creation the creator in every religion every theistic religion so what is the idea of um, of god in in vedanta brahman with the power of maya is the cause of the projection of this universe its sustenance and its eventual reabsorption so from brahman it emerges in brahman it exists in into brahman it disappears this whole process happens because of brahman's power called maya so this is the idea another example would be our life every day when we dream we have an experience of a dream world the dream world emerges from our mind and we are ourselves there in the dream world it's a, all an experience projected a virtual reality projected by our minds every night now all the people and the things and the events and the places all of that in the dream world they were there in seed form in our mind it's from our subconscious mind the material the mind takes the material and generates a, a dream world and when we wake up what happens where does the dream world go it disappears back into an unmanifest form 
within the mind. But the seeds are there. We can continue to have similar dreams again. So this is basically the idea of creation and destruction in, in Vedanta, in Hinduism. There is a technical... Yes, hold on to the question. There is a technical word for this. Uh, I have explained it already, but I'll let me introduce the term. Satkaryavada. Do come in. There's enough space. Yes, you come and sit. This is called Satkaryavada. Satkaryavada literally means pre-existence of the effect in the form of the cause. Now we can understand. Karya means effect. Karana means cause. And the question is, is the effect an entirely new thing or was it existing in some other form earlier? The answer given by this theory, it's a theory of causation. There are different other theories of causation also. But this is the theory adopted by many Indian schools, including Vedanta, which says that the effect pre-existed in the cause. So, like the, if you say the tree pre-existed as a potential in the seed, the pots all pre-existed as possibilities in, in clay. Um, so the universe pre-existed. Uh, as a potential in Maya. So this is called Satkaryavada. The effect pre-existing as the cause. Suppose uh, somebody says, a beautiful statue is sculpted by a mas master sculptor. Now, in one sense, it's the creation of that person's genius. But if you look at the material itself, every bit of it is there. One way of thinking of, the, of this uh, sculpting is that he just removes the unnecessary parts. So an existing sculpture emerges from the, from the rock or marble or whatever it is. So that's one way of looking at it. This is what he has introduced here. There were two hands up. Let's quickly deal with the questions. I'll come to you. Um, Swamiji, since we're talking about death, um, why is there a universal fear of death? I mean, as sentient beings are thinking beings, you can understand probably you're afraid of the unknown and see other things suffer and so on. But even in animals, you know, even a fly wants to live. Mm -hmm. why, is, why is this you know, universal? Yes, this is deep and fundamental. I earlier mentioned that book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker. Yes, it is a deep-rooted fear. And many people might say, no, no, I'm not afraid of it. I don't even think about it. Ah, there is the thing. You don't even think about it. <laughs> Ernst Becker, who was a very well-known um, psychoanalyst, in his book, Denial of Death, he says, it's the dominant fear of, uh, of, of our lives. Especially in the later part of our lives, it, it plays a role, and it often plays a subconscious role. It drives us. So, and he has a very interesting take on it. Now, why are we afraid of it? Well, there are many obvious reasons. We are, first of all, we are afraid of, uh, we, we expect pain and suffering at the time of death. Vedanta would say that we have gone through many such deaths in the past. So that impression is there, the terror of that transition is there in our minds. So that's what we expect. Another thing is, everything coming to an end, who likes that? Every bit of what we are, what we are used to. Father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, friends, enemies. Um, <laughs> Everything, our life coming to an end. This body itself, it's going to go. And what's after that? Maybe nothing. Or maybe a complete unknown. If I do exist, it's an unknown existence. Or maybe it's a void, it's nothing. So, terror seizes us. In fact, um, Jung, Carl Jung, he says that one of the causes of psychopathology in most of my middle-aged patients, the central cause, is this unspoken fear of death. He says it, it, it expresses itself as a variety of mental maladies. All right. So, uh, Swamiji, whenever we read uh, a classic text, like, uh, let's say, Apal Kanukuti, so there when we were uh, taking this example of taking a pot and philosophically like breaking it down to clay, hmm. where we say that 
we are going from the pod vision to the clear vision. Yes. The conclusion, the way it was concluded, used to be that there was never a pod. Huh. It was always a clear. It was always clear. And now when we discuss the theory of creation and destruction, huh. as per Vedanta, then how do you uh, say that they are like synonymous? Right. So this is a general idea which is giving. It's not only Advaita Vedanta. Sankhya also ex- accepts it. Now, the special spin put on it by Advaita Vedanta is that when the, the potter makes uh, a pot out of clay, that's all that Krishna is saying here. From the unmanifest, it becomes manifest as what? As a pot. Earlier, there was no sign of a pot. It was just clay. Now, it's clearly a pot. So, that is called creation. More precisely, if you want to define it, what is creation according to this particular school of Indian philosophy, Satkarya Vada? From cause to effect, uh, creation is the, um, the, the manifestation of the effect. That it takes a certain name and form and you can uh, experience it, see it. That is called creation. Um, now, the special spin that Advaita Vedanta puts on it is, Advaita is asking, when the potter makes a pot, clay into pot, has he made something new, substance-wise? Is there a new thing? Are there now two things, clay and pot? Can you numerically count them separately? We say no. Then what is the nature of the pot then? It is clay, and yet it's not clay, it's something new. So then what is new? Name and form and use. And this name, form and use in Sanskrit, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara is called Maya. Right. The difference is, is this. There is a lot of discussion, they call it the debate between Parinama and Vivarta. Real transformation versus apparent transformation. The Sankhya schools and many of the devotional schools of Vedanta, the dualistic schools, they say actually Brahman has transformed itself, himself or herself into the universe. It's an actual transformation. And uh, so like milk becomes curd or yogurt and it's actually transformed. You cannot dare say that it's milk appearing as yogurt. If somebody wants a glass of milk and you say, here is a cup of yogurt. And you say, but I wanted milk. Oh, it is milk. Didn't you go to the Vedanta class? It's, <laughs> it's milk with the name and form of yogurt. No, that won't cut the ice. It won't, it won't do. It is yogurt. It has actually been transformed into yogurt. But, I'll come to that. Uh, but but uh, in the case of what, what Vedanta wants to say, that the universe is not like that. It's not an actual transformation of Brahman. It's more like snake and rope. So when the rope is appearing as the snake, it has not actually transformed into the snake. It is the rope. Even when it looks like a snake, I mean, even when we are scared of it, it's still just the rope and there's no snake at all. Only temporarily due to the effect of error, we think that it's ignorance and error. We think it's a snake. or We even feel that we saw a snake. So that is called vivarta, apparent transformation. That's what Vedanta wants to say. And that's why Vedanta wants to say that the pot is nothing more than the clay. But uh, the Sankhyan philosopher would say, no, no, the pot is something new. You have, you have done, actually done. That's more closer to our common sense. That's, not, that's the way we mostly think. That something new has come up. The potter has done something new. Right. Question? Mystery. mystery. Yeah, the mystery is coming now. Next verse is said, it's going to talk about a mystery. Right. Uh, is that what, what you wanted to say? Uh, I don't know if it's, I like the same verse, but, uh, yeah. We are doing 28. The mystery is coming in 29. <laughs> 29 is all about mystery. Uh-huh. Let, let's read 29 then. We are leading into 29. Let's just hear the questions. I will not uh, answer them now, but he, let's hear the questions. 
The what? Maya. Maya is only in the, in the universe, right? Oh, the universe is in Maya. Maya is not in the universe. Yes. The universe is in Maya. Yes. So again, in this transactional reality, we are constantly doing actions and generating thoughts and doing actions. Yes. So uh, how do we get met in relation? It, does an unselfish action also generate so that's a question. Uh, how? What was the word? Did you say? That? How do you get a net neutral, <laughs> uh, a neutral balance? It's never going to happen that way. Um, Vedanta says the only way you can you can um, transcend this is by realizing that you are Brahman, and so you go beyond the realm of karma altogether. Um, Swami Vivekananda says, "Good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. But whosoever wears a form, form means this one." Where's the chain to? What's the chain? And a, ve- a beginningless chain of cause and effect, karma, which has produced this one. Then what is Vedanta? Far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. Know thou art that sannyasi bold and say Om Tat Sat Om. If you know yourself as that, you are free. The chain of cause and effect, according to Vedanta, it's also illusory. Knowledge will destroy it completely. Um, Gita also says, all karmas are destroyed by knowledge. So how karma can be destroyed by knowledge? Only possible. What is it that knowledge can destroy? Ignorance. ignorance. And the product of ignorance is never real. The snake produced by ignorance is an error, a mistake. There's no real snake there. The dream, the, all the things that happened in dream, it's in, in an ignorance of our, deep, of our sleep. So they are not real. The solution for the dream problem is waking up. The solution for the snake problem is the knowledge of the rope. Right? The solution for samsara problem is not more karma or better karma, but waking up to our our real nature. Having said that, in this transactional world, what do we do then? What are we supposed to do? Waking up is all well and good, but I am unable to wake up. Now what do I do? So Krishna will actually talk about that later on. Once this topic is concluded, the very next topic is karma yoga. What do we do? These are very powerful forces that we have set in motion. We are not aware of that. What we are right now is the result of all of that. Swami Vivekananda says, karma. What we are today is the net result of all we have done and thought in the past. So what we do now and think now is, uh, has a tremendous effect of, on what we are going to experience in lives to come. So how to deal with that, that will come later. But if you want a straight answer, the real answer, wake up. <laughs> wake up to what? Wake up to your real, real nature, what you are. What is my real nature? That's what we talked about. But it's also a mystery. That's what's going to come now. 29th verse. It's a very mysterious verse. <laughs> he is uh, uh, summing up the entire teaching. He's characterizing it as a great mystery. If it is so direct... Why don't I experience it? If I am the Atman, why don't I know myself as such? Why do I think I am a body, mind, a person? If it is everywhere, how come I don't see it anywhere? If it is all the time, why don't I see it anytime? That is the question. And here is the answer. Or no answer. This is the thing. 29th verse. Ascharyavat pasyati kaschidenam Ascharyavad pasyati kaschidenam Ascharyavad vadati tatheva janya Ascharyavad vadati tatheva janya Ascharyavad jaina manya srinoti Ascharyavad jaina manya srinoti Shrutvapyenam vedana chaiva kaschet Shrutvapyenam vedana chaiva kaschet one sees this self, Atman, as a wonder, a mystery, if you want to use the word mystery, as a wonder. Another talks of it as a wonder. Another hears of it as a wonder, as a mystery. And some others, again, even after hearing about it, they don't know it, they don't realize it. So what does it mean? <laughs> He's basically talking about the extraordinarily subtle nature of the teaching. So let's go into this verse. What does it mean? And remember, all the time I'm giving you mostly a non-dualistic interpretation. So if you pick up an interpretation of the Gita from a dualistic school, from a bhakti school, you'll get a different uh, take on it. All right, the first one. Some see it, some 
person sees this, this means the Atman as a wonder, as a mystery. Why is it a wonder or a mystery? Pashyati. Pashyati means sees. One sees it. The thing is, this Atman, the one which we are trying to understand, our real nature, is not an object of the senses. It is not something that you can see, not something, though you are using the word see. Pashya, Pashya means to see, but not, it also means not just literally see with eyes. It also means get an insight, to realize, to come. We use it in English also, getting an insight. We say, oh, I see. That means, oh, I understand. So Pashyati, it's not something that you can actually see with your eyes. It's not something that you can hear or smell or taste or touch. It's not also something that one can actually conceive of and, and come to an understanding with the mind. In, in say, the teachers say, Indriya man buddhi ka vishaya nahi hai. It's not an object of the senses. It's not an object for the mind or the intellect. And therefore, it's a mystery. Something that I can understand, not a mystery. Something that I can sp- see, hear, smell, taste, touch, not a mystery. But something that is there and yet it's beyond my sensory uh, apparatus, it's beyond my intellectual capacity, then it's a mystery. So some see it as a wonder. Why is it so? This Atman, see every knowledge in, this, in, our, in our experience requires three things. Knower, the knowable object and knowledge. Gyata, Gyanya, Gyana in Sanskrit. The knower, the knowable object and the knowledge of that object. So it is called Triputi. Triputi means the three, the three, um, three aspects of epistemology. Um, or you can put it this way, the knower and the instrument of knowledge and the object of knowledge. So you are listening to me. You are the knower. My words are something that you know. And you are using your, the whole apparat, sensory apparatus of your ears and the mind to know this. So there are three here. The knower, the known, and the, the instrument of knowledge. Or knowledge itself, whatever you can call it. So Triputi. In the case of Atman, none of these three will work. First of all, it's not an object to be known. Because why, why is it not an object? Because it doesn't exist. Huh? Is that true? No. Why is it not an object? Because well, then what is it? It's a subject. It's you yourself. It's not a thing that you know. It is you yourself. It is the knower oneself. So it cannot be an object of knowledge. It is beyond the range of all the instruments of knowledge. So the instruments of knowledge do not work there. And so one... Then say, at least the knower is there. I am there. Yes, it's your very, very self. So you cannot say that you are the knower of that self in the sense of knowing, you know, in the sense in which you see things, hear things, smell things, in the, in the sense in which we memorize things, uh, understand things. In none of these senses are you the knower of the Atman. Even the enlightened person, the person who has become enlightened has realized, I am this. Uh, even that person is not a knower in, in this sense, in the sense we are normally used to. So, to put it this way, that these three, the Triputi, knower, known knowledge, or knower, known, and the instruments of knowledge, do not apply here. So, so it's a mystery. Therefore, it's a mystery. But then, how is it known? Is it completely unknown? No, we don't say that. If it was completely unknown, then the book would be of no use. It can be known. But How? Quite apart from all of this, is there any other way of knowing? Is there any other way of seeing? Is there any other way of realizing it? Yes. The Atman is known by itself. It knows itself by itself. There's no other way of putting it. It's an entirely unique thing. Nothing else uh, works here. Let me give you an example. In a dark room, there is something in a dark room. Now you take a light and you go there, shine the light upon that object. Maybe it's a book or something. And then you can see the object. An object is necessary, the light is necessary, your eyes are necessary. All of them are necessary to know that. Alright? So there is an object of knowledge which is separate from you, which is not you. 
There are instruments of knowledge. The light is a necessary condition. Your eyes are a necessary condition. Mind has to be alert. All of that. And you the knower. All are necessary. The three are necessary for knowing it. Now suppose you are in that dark room. Um, I ask you, how did you know, th know that there is a book? I saw it. How did you see it? With my own eyes. With the help of the light. Now if I ask you, are you there in that dark room? Yes, I am there. How do you know? With what light, with what eyes do you know? Suppose there is no light. Now can you say that there is a book? No, I can't say it. Can you say whether you are there or not? Yes, yes, I can say I am there. Shut your eyes in the dark room. No light, no eyes. Close your eyes. Can you now say whether there is a book or not? No. Can you say, are you there? Will you say, let me open my eyes first. Let me see. No. <laughs> let me switch on the light first. No. Let me ask my friend, can you see me? Am I there? <laughs> no. You are continuously revealed to yourself without any effort. Even that, so is that Atman? No, even the, that is not there. That is the reflected consciousness in the mind. That points to the real consciousness. That has to be grasped. So this gives an indication of what it means of knowing oneself by oneself. We do it all the time. Our own existence is revealed to us by itself. Then what is the problem? The problem is this continuous self-revelation that I am doesn't seem to be of much use. In fact, it is the source of all problems for us. Because it immediately becomes entangled with body, with mind, and all the problems of body and mind. I am. Immediately it becomes, I am sick. Oh. <laughs> I am cold. Winter solstice. I saw in a computer, even in the Google is shivering, it says winter solstice. <laughs> I am, but cold. I am poor. Or I am a student and I have to, there is an exam coming up. I am in tension. All sorts of problems. World problems, body problems, mind problems, relationship problems. The I am is entangled. The pure I am, we have no, no sense of that. Uh, that Vedanta is, is trying to reveal that to us. Vedanta is trying to show us that the I am is actually not entangled with, uh, with, the, with the body mind problems. The body mind and its problems. Anyway, that's the project. So, my point here was. If I say the Atman is, uh, the, the true self is known by itself, do you get a sense of what is mean, meant by knowing something by itself? It knows itself by itself. This statement, is it making some sense to you when I say the way you know yourself in a dark room where you cannot see anything, hear anything, your eyes are closed, yet you absolutely without any doubt, you know that you are there. That is a, that gives you a sense of what is meant here. This is said to be this self-knowledge, the knowledge of the self. There's a word they use in Sanskrit, karana nirapeksha, independent of instrument of knowledge. There is knowledge which is dependent on the instruments of knowledge. What we see depends on eyes. What we hear depends on ears. What we think and remember depends on the mind and memory. They are instruments. If you think that, if you don't, don't agree, just ask an, uh, a person whose memory is failing. That person clearly sees that something, I am there, but there's something within me that's failing. It's clearly an instrument. Memory is an instrument. Mind is an instrument. Intellect is an instrument. You see, I'm not as quick as I used to be. Intellect is an instrument. These are all instruments and they deliver knowledge. They produce, or they, they generate knowledge for us. They operate upon their respective objects. What do I mean respective objects? The eyes operate on form. The ears operate on sound. The tongue on taste and the nose on smell and so on. These are instruments and the knowledge they generate is born of the action of these instruments. Without these instruments, though, that knowledge will not be generated. That knowledge depends on these instruments. Knowledge depends upon its source. But the self-knowledge, the knowledge of the self, Atma Jnana, is independent of these instruments. 
It may take the help of the instruments. You need all these instruments to come to Vedanta class, to listen to Vedanta class, to even understand and memorize the verses. You need all the instruments. But the realization when it comes, it comes in the Atman by the Atman. You yourself have to intuit yourself. And in a flash you realize, this is what I am. Is it too difficult or is, it, or is it 1 to 10? 1 to 10, I can't rank it. <laughs> 1 to 10, if you, if you ask for a ranking, the answer is it's a mystery. <laughs> but but your, the second part you asked is, how difficult is it? Is it that we are not trying? The answer is always, it depends. How easy is it? It's, it's the easiest of all things. It's continuously available to us. It is effortlessly available to us. How easy is, easy is it? It's not at all easy. <laughs> The difficulty, in terms of the difficulty, the difficulty is generated by us. It's not that the Atman, is, there's any difficulty in realizing the Atman. We have generated the difficulty. Now, it is easily available to us if you sincerely seek for it. That's the only answer that can, I can say. Sri Ramakrishna puts it in bhakti terms, Vyakulata, intense desire to know it. A, a monk once said this, that a sincere seeking must be there. You sincerely, energetically, passionately seek it, you will know it. It's, it's all guaranteed. But you will have to do it. Nobody else can do it for you. Up to the last point, people can help you. Vedanta class can help you. The guru can help you. Philosophers can help you. Your own practices with the instruments can help you. Remember, all practices, spiritual practices are done with the instruments. If you want to do good deeds, you need the body. If you want to repeat the name of God, you need the mind and the, and the hands to count the japa and all of that. So all of these, you require the instruments. All these practices, they have their effects. But they can't lead you to the ultimate realization. They can get you to the very edge where you realize by yourself. Atman, it says, the Atman reveals itself upon whom it has its grace. It says, who will realize? That one will realize to whom the Atman reveals itself. Atman means you yourself. You will realize it if, you, if the true you reveals yourself to yourself. Now, in the Bhakti schools, the interpretation of this is very easy. Because they will immediately say, Bhagavan, God, whomever God is gracious upon, God reveals himself to that that being so it's a direct interpretation but it's a little difficult for a non-dualist to interpret it puts Shankaracharya in a spot because it says the Atman reveals or Upanishad just directly says that or is that Atman or God or whatever that to whomever it is uh, it reveals itself to that to whomever it chooses to whomever it chooses it reveals itself in terms of God talk, in the talk of um, this atheistic religion, it's pretty easy. Whomever God chooses will reveal. Whomever God is gracious upon. But in, a, in the sense of Atman, in, in a non-dualism, what will you do? Whomever it chooses. Whom does it choose? And there Shankaracharya says this exactly what you pointed out. Whom does it choose? Shankaracharya writes in his commentary. It chooses the one who chooses it. The one who seeks it. The one who wants it. The one who chooses it. Um, hold on to your questions. Let me finish this verse. Don't forget your questions. So, reveals itself by itself. That's one point. That's why it's a wonder. Because nothing else is like this. All this, what am I explaining? I'm explaining the first word. Wonder, ascharyam. Ascharyam means wonder, mystery. So, I'm all this while I've been explaining the first word in this verse. Um... Enam, this one. This one means the Atmanam, Dehi. It's called the indweller in the body. We have covered this, but it's good to repeat. I'll keep repeating. So many questions are answered by this framework. What is the framework? What is the Atman? It's the, uh, Krishna prefers to call it the indweller in the body. Dehi, Shariri, the one in this body, in the Sharira. We actually have three bodies. 
according to Vedanta. He said, no, I had just this one. I can't manage one, now three. Just imagine the medical insurance. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not three physical bodies. You have one physical body, like this one. But within this body, there is what Vedanta calls a subtle body, sukshma sharira. And innermost is what is called a causal body, karana sharira. In Sanskrit, sthula sharira, physical body, sukshma sharira, subtle body, karana sharira, causal body. If you want to further details, what exactly... The physical body we all understand, this one. The one which doctor weighs and examines and pokes and prods, that is the physical body. Um, the subtle body is when we look inside and we find thoughts, feelings, desires, emotions, memories. What we call the person I am. Not accessible to the doctor. Not accessible to your uh, physician. No. Isn't it so? Which instrument can discover your, um, your uh, whether you perf- uh, prefer cappuccino or la- latte? Which instrument? They can at the most scan some parts of your brain and find some corresponding neuronal activity. But your desire itself, your thoughts, your beliefs, the actual ex- first person experience you are having, which instrument? Nothing. At the most they can go to the brain and see some activity there. So that subtle body is, is the thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, what we feel inside. That is a subtle body. If you go beyond that, beyond that means in your inner experience, you will hit a blank wall. Nothing. What else is that beyond that? If you dismiss the physical body, suppose you have no sensation of the body, you hear nothing, see nothing, smell nothing, taste nothing, touch nothing, you remember nothing, you do not talk internally, you do not desire anything, hate anything, I do not, uh, I'm not trying to understand anything, look for anything. Stop. It's a blankness. That blankness is called the causal body. The Atman is beyond, it helps to think of it as encased. Though it's not encased in that sense, but it's, it's a first step. Think of it as other than, uh, the real I is not this body, is not even the person. That's a big step. Most of us, are sort of irrevocably committed to the idea that I am a person in a body. Not even the person. Not even the blankness blankness which ensues when you dismiss the person. Intellectually. Beyond that is the Atman. That's what Krishna is trying to point out. So these three bodies. Further detail, if you want further detail. The physical body, Sthula Sharira, is composed of, is, is what is called the Annamaya Kosha. The made of the food and drink that we have eaten, converted into physical body. The subtle body has three components. Uh, mano- pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha. The vital sheath, the mental sheath and the sheath of the intellect. That is the subtle body. And the causal body is called anandamaya kosha, kosha the, the sheath of bliss. Why? We will not go into it today. If you want further detail, uh, go further in, and see, you know, turn up the resolution of the microscope. What are these, the subtle body, what is it made of further? Physical body we know, the doctors have mm, tremendous knowledge of the physical body, down to cellular and intracellular level. The subtle body, if you look, pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha, further if you look closer, it reveals itself as 19 parts. So in Vedanta, 19 parts, uh, the way Vedanta understands it, um, the five sense organs, the five or not the physical part of it, the powers, the activities, the functions of those organs. Five sense organs, the five motor organs, the five pranas, they call pancha prana, the vital activity, the physiological prana. Five pranas and mana, buddhi, chitta, ahankara, mind, intellect, memory and ego. 19 parts, five plus five plus five plus four. This, these are the three bodies. And when the, what am I trying to explain here? The word enam means this. This what? This self. This self is not any of these. It is the dweller in this three body system. This triple body system apart from physical body, apart from subtle body, apart from causal body. There is a reality. 
the witness consciousness that is the atman hence hence it's a mystery we are still explaining the first word mystery why is it a mystery there are any number of mysteries in the physical body we are still plumbing the complexity and the marvel of the physical body the mysteries become even more difficult in the subtle body and causal body beyond our thinking we don't even it's not even in ordinary discourse but atman is beyond that hence a mystery so who can realize it he says kashchit a rare one a rare one who is that rare one here it refers to the qualified seeker so vedanta has a system a list of qualities which are required do you remember them the fourfold qualification viveka the an- analysis between the eternal and non-eternal vairagya dispassion for the non-eternal the six fold treasure uh ah. calmness of mind shama control of the senses dhamma um titiksha a spiritual forbearance uh uparati withdrawal from messing around with the <laughs> world too much uh then uh, samadhana settling down in our vedantic pursuit and shraddha a firm faith that there is something in this i, I will realize it so six fold treasure and finally the fourth one um uh, mumukshutvam an intense desire for freedom so we must have plenty of um, fuel in all of these four engines to propel us to this realization now he says kashchit only a rare one has all these qualities that's why it becomes difficult don't be discouraged we all have it to some extent you all have it to some extent otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here today on a on a friday evening why waste a perfect friday evening you know before a weekend in manhattan that too and come and listen to a 5000 year old philosophy because there is a spiritual inquiry because there is a spiritual thirst when these qualifications are rattled off people tend to get rattled maybe it's not for me maybe i'm never going to do it somebody asked ramana maharshi you know he of the who am i fame somebody asked am i qualified to realize this truth because if you look at all this you feel discouraged am i qualified to realize become enlightened am i qualified and ramana maharshi said did you say i <laughs> because the method is the whole project is who am i if you say i you are qualified because you have an eye to to investigate you are qualified so we are all, we have all got an eye to we have the self we are that after all we are that of course we are qualified but we have to work on it okay next comes another mystery ascharya vad vadati tatheva chanya another one teaches it a, it's it's a mystery to see it itself to realize itself it's a mystery to teach it is is another mystery why is it a mystery i almost run out of time <laughs> this this verse is a mysterious verse <laughs> why why is it a mystery to teach it anya means the other other here means the the teacher the teacher for the teacher this it has a special problem because it is beyond language beyond conception that which is beyond language how can you speak it vadati means speaks teaches vedanta teaches about the atman krishna is teaching arjuna with what with words what is the vehicle of teaching what is the vehicle of communication words language and yet you have clearly defined the atman as something beyond words then how do you do it mystery in the kena upanishad there is a beautiful uh, place, um, point where the teacher is about to teach the student has gone to the teacher na vidmo na vijani mo yathaita danushishyat the teacher says we do not know it is it we we do not know it the atman you are seeking the teacher says we do not know it nor do we know how to teach it can you teach us enlightenment about the self self knowledge of vedanta the teacher says we do not know how how it can be taught well at least you are enlightened right am 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 i wrong on that count he says you know it right the teacher says we do not know it also so before the student gets up and <laughs> storms out having be, uh, wasted uh, an afternoon maybe going to the teacher the teacher says hold on um there is a way 
and it's a way taught to us by our by the ancient masters by which the lineage of masters have attained enlightenment age after age i can try it on you and see if it works mm-hmm. and the language there in the is um navayani mo yathaita anushishyad iti shushruma purvesham yanas tad vichachakshire hence we have heard from the ancient ones who have taught us in this way what is the way let me try it hold on to the question let me try it we can try it right now see if it works on you uh, it can't be expressed it can't be known now you know why it cannot be known we already discussed it it cannot be known as an object but you you can lead a person to enlightenment let's try it how the kane upanishad the teacher says this is how we were taught by ancient ones it worked for us let's see if it works for you all right what is it anya deva tadviditad atho aviditad adhi you want to know the atman yes it is other than that atman is other than anything that you know whatever you know you know all of us we know something whatever we know what we have read heard tasted touched smelled uh, what we have conceived of what we whatever we know in life till today it's not the atman oh so it's an unknown it is beyond all that is unknown also whatever remains for you to know whatever is in the universe which you do not know see it cleanly divides into two things mutually exclusive sets at this moment one is something that you know all that you know you can put it all that you believe know hear everything and there is a huge circle i think it's einstein who said that the uh, sea of the unknown you know we are it's like like a little island that we know and it's surrounded by a vast sea of unknown so there's a vast sea of unknown atman is not what you know and that unknown thing atman is not there also it's not an unknown thing it's not a known thing then what is it what is the only thing that is not known not unknown or let me make it even more clear all things in this universe can be divided into two for each of us things you know things you do not know what is the one one reality which does not fall in the things you know and the things that you do not know you the knower the knower among the knowables there are two kinds the known and the unknown right now for you for every one of us but apart from the known apart from the unknown there is the knower did it work are you enlightened <laughs> you are laughing if you are not enlightened then we need further detail could you could you explain it to us little further it sounds interesting 18 chapters <laughs> bhagavad gita uh, 700 verses yes question yes Yes. So Dakshinamurti Stotram talks about it's a beautiful hymn uh, composed by Adi Shankar Acharya. Dakshinamurti is the south facing Shiva. The the iconography is Shiva as teacher, one who teaches Brahma gyana, the knowledge of atman, enlightenment, and faces south and has this posture. This this is called a mudra. Ah, chin mudra. You know what is chin mudra? Now you can understand. These three these three are the three bodies physical body subtle body causal body three bodies this is the atman this is the i instead of identifying with the f- these three you take it and identify it with the atman that is enlightenment this is the chin mudra chin mudra chin means consciousness actually it, it's exactly the process is embodied in this this is the whole teaching it's very interesting also it's something that is common to um all human beings and some of the higher apes it is called the opposable thumb 
Uh, it enables civilization to... Uh, because of this, we have civilization actually. There are animals who can't do this. They have paws like this. Only human beings and some other creatures are there. This enables us to use tools. Opposable thumb. Also, another thing you will notice. Anybody in the world, who need, it need not, this science of mudras is a vast thing. Anybody in the world who does not even know this, anybody who is trying to convey something to other, I have, I have something interesting to tell you. Uh, it's, and convey not in the sense of gossip. Convey in the sense of, an, of a, of a um, subtle idea or realization, an insight. They will do this. Have you noticed? You will notice? This is what I want to tell you. They do this. Automatically. It doesn't have to be a Vedanta or Dakshinamurti or anything like that. It's something psychological. So these, uh, these, it's a different subject. It's a vast subject called mudras. Mudras means the way you place your hands uh, and the fingers, the different postures. And they have meanings, symbolic meanings, and they have effect on your mind. So when you meditate, we put our hands like this. Chin mudra upside down like this. There are other mudras. This is one mudra. This is one mudra. And there are, uh, you use them in, in pujas. They have immediate effect on the, on the mind. This is one mudra. <laughs> this is another mudra. So all of these are different mudras. Um, and they have different meanings. And they are different effects on the person who does it. Uh, and this was a very ancient, um, I would say a science in itself. Of which we only have the vestiges left. All right. Yes, quickly. Ramakrishna, what was the prime like spiritual document that he used? Spiritual document? Yeah, yeah, for his own like uh, for his own spiritual work. Spiritual document in the sense like book. A, a prime reference. To he uh, well, if you look at the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Kathamrita, you will find he refers to. Gita, he, he um, recommends the Gita strongly. In Bengali, he says, Gita khub boi Gita purbe. Gita is a very good book, read the Gita. He speaks very favorably about Adhyatma Ramayana. And about Vedantic scriptures, he would, whenever they were mentioned, he would actually fold his hands and bow his head. <laughs> uh, about the, uh, the Upanishads and the uh, Gita too also. Vedas, any Vedic hymn was chanted. Um, Many other scriptures come into the story of Sri Ramakrishna. For example, some bhakti texts are there. Bhagavat is mentioned. Um, then Ashtavakra is something that he valued. It was a very radical non-dualistic text. Also remember, he was not particularly textual himself. He was critical of pandits who, um, who were masters of the text and yet were not enlightened. We are going to come to that now. Uh, why after all of this you are still not enlightened, we'll see. So these are some of the texts which come up in, in the story of Sri Ramakrishna. Now the qu question remains, so it cannot be expressed by speech and why cannot not, can, can it not be, today I'll just leave you with this, why can it not be expressed by speech and how do the teachers manage to teach it, which makes it a wonder. Why it cannot be expressed by speech, um, that I have a talk, you should look up on YouTube, uh, Paradox of Language. Advaita Vedanta and the paradox of language. This Atman, Brahman, why is it beyond language? And if it is beyond language, then how do you express it through language? Because Gita is language. Upanishads are language. All the texts are language. So there are strategies which are involved. If you are interested, I can take it up next time. And uh, Alright, we can spend some time on it next time also. Let me complete the verse. We will revert back to that point next time. Before we go ahead. Um, so, that makes it a mystery, because everything else can be expressed by language, this cannot be expressed by language, and yet the teacher has to express it by language, hence a mystery. Another point, the teacher also has to be extraordinary. The qualifications of the teacher, I just mention it here, Upanishads say, Shrotriya Akamahata Brahmanishta. Shrotriya means well-versed in Vedanta. Akamahata means literally not not damaged or injured by desire. That the teacher must not have any kind of worldly desire. Yes, teacher has a desire that you become enlightened. That's alright. 
but the teacher should not have any other worldly expectation from the student. You hear you are making donations, but the traditional Vedanta school uh, in ancient times is the teacher who had to pay for you. So actually I should pay for you <laughs> to stay, study, all your stay and study and everything is free. So that you stay on. And, and when after you're finished, then when you leave, then you, you give something for the, it's called Guru Dakshina. So that was the idea. Guru Dakshina means uh, an offering to the teacher. And that's why these ashrams were maintained by donations from kings and all. And um, in those days, Vedanta teachers had the same problem today, looking for donations and grants. Uh, because we find one of the greatest discussions on Vedanta in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, where Yagya Valkya, the great master of Vedanta, goes to the emperor, the king, Janaka. And the king says, have you come for donations? Which means he had been coming pretty often for donations. <laughs> Literally says, for cows. In those days, cows were the wealth. Have you come for cows or do you want to have a discussion on philosophy? And Yagya Valka says, both. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of, uh, and there's a discussion. It's a fantastic piece, uh, Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. One of the most ancient, the most ancient available Upanishad. And an extraordinary discussion. One of our swamis in New Delhi is going with the file to a central government office there to get grants for the ashram. And the, and the officer uh, to whom he had gone approached, Swami, um, have you come for money or for discussion about Brahman? And the Swami says, both. And then he came and t told us the story. <laughs> you want to discuss philosophy or have you come here for money? <laughs> uh, oh, actually, the officer said, Swami, the money we will give you Talk about something good in, uh, for a change, not just how much money you need. <laughs> so that was the discussion. Uh, so the teacher, Akamahata, should not have any worldly desire. And finally, Brahmanishta must be established in Brahman. Best is if it, the teacher is enlightened. But how do you know if the teacher is enlightened? And how many enlightened teachers will you get? So established in Brahman means the one who is, whose life is dedicated to Brahman, not a part-time Vedanta teacher. At the very least, this person must be, must be a serious seeker of Brahman, completely dedicated to, the, to cultivating uh, Vedanta and seeking enlightenment. So Brahmanishta means established in Brahman. In the Sanskrit word nishtha, uh, in, in Indian languages also it's there. So these are the three qualifications of the teacher. That is what is meant by the teacher is also unique. The student has the qualifications. You remember fourfold qualification? And the teacher also has these qualifications. I'll end with a story. So we couldn't complete this verse. We'll do it next time. Uh, I'll end with a story of how Latu Maharaj, Swami Adbhutananda, who had no formal education to speak of, is called one of the miracles of Sri Ramakrishna. He attained enlightenment, Brahma Jnana. Now, he saw his brother monks, Vivekananda and others, studying Vedanta. Studying philosophy, Vedanta, history, so many things. And Latu Maharaj said, why all this? This is not necessary for enlightenment. Our master showed us the direct path to enlightenment. All this study, so many books, not necessary. And then he himself says later on, that is true, you all need it. Because you are going to be teachers of, 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 of humanity. So as teachers, you need all of this. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, rather gruesome example, to kill yourself, don't. To, to, to kill yourself, you just, one needs just a nail, a, a nail. But to, to fight with the enemy, you need a sword and a shield. What he meant by that is, self-realization just for yourself is not so difficult. Um, simple teachings are enough. I mean, the teacher says, other than the known, other than the unknown, enough. <laughs> if you follow that up, Ramana Maharshi says, who am I? Follow that up, it's enough. But if you have to convey this teaching to others, and many others of different tempera temperaments, different backgrounds, so you need a wide range of learning and a command over, uh, over these, this philosophy and different philosophies. So the teacher is also unique, because the one who teaches this mystery. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu